Jacob Bourne, gonna reuse this tune, cause it's the one in my head. Jacob Bourne, we both have fantasies, but have you ever been in mine? Well, no well, fucking well. way, I don't like you that much. Come on, bro, I love you, but not that way. Dude, seriously, please take your hand off my lap. Well, that was, that was, that was beautiful. I think we need to get you, uh, some more music though. To diversify your tunes. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing I really have in my head is, uh, is Do I Wanna Know by the Arctic Monkeys. And if you don't know that song, it's the Bacardi music in their commercials these days. Uh, it, but I don't know how to sing to that. That's fair. I um, just I just know I feel like a G whenever I hear it. I uh I have been bumping to uh Bonfire by Childish Gambino recently and so that's been stuck in my head for a few days. Don't know it. I, I can I can break out a few uh a few verse a few lines if you would like me to. Sure. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay, it's childish Gambino, homegirl, drop it like the Nasdaq. Move white girls like there's coke on my cl- ass crack. Move white girls saying, fuck it, I love pussy, I love juicy, everything I da 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 da. And MD does with them short shorts, B O O all over me. And that's all I can do because he raps really, really fast. That sounds like the music they write in cartoons, maybe the Boondocks, for example, <laughs> to make fun of the music industry. Um, kind of. Well, if you know him, if you know him, it's Childish Gambino is also also known as Donald Glover. Is uh, that his real name? I think so. Uh, is maybe. He, is it Donald Glover from Community? Yes, it is. Okay. It. Uh, it, that is it, that is him. Yes, he's Childish Gambino, and um, it's it's he's a good song. He, he's he's a good writer, and I like it. And it's very it's very like kind of angry rap but at the same time not really um it's just a really good song so that's what i've been jamming to what song is that yeah i don't know you're the one that finished it it's a very like arena rock music it's kid rock it is kid rock from the, like 1998 I don't know. I don't know the song. Yeah, it was before your time. Before my time, bitch, please. I was listening to Blues Travelers at the age of four, okay? I mean, that's because you're from the Midwest. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I was listening to Queen when I was in diapers. That counts. That's because you have two dads? It's because I have one dad who's very who knows his rock. Queen and ACDC got me out of the Barney stage. Let's see, for me it was uh Paul Simon and the Who. Okay. Very respectable. Yeah. But it was played on loop, so Yeah. This is back in the days when we had to use CDs to listen to music and not these iPods that all these kids have. Oh fuck. Uh, I didn't even have that. That was cassettes then. Oh you yeah, you were still in the cassette ages. Dude, I didn't really start to like music. Until I heard Sublime's self-titled album. What was that, 94? 95? Well, for me, that was like two, probably like 2000, maybe 2001. Okay. And, uh, that makes me 13, 14 years old. Um, I had always kind of, thought of music as background noise it's because whenever I was playing sports there was music on in the background or right. when I was helping my parents cook there was music on in the background or when we were in the car driving from Long Island to Vermont or Pennsylvania there was music on in the background so I never really thought about music as anything other than that right. uh, but I was gifted a CD radio player a CD player that could also play the radio. I do know those. 
Or was it a radio that could also play CDs? Hmm. Uh, I prefer to call it a portable CD player. Yeah, I prefer that too. Well, I have to admit that uh, through most of high school, I mostly listened to the radio on that device, and it was because I only had like 10 CDs. Oh, yeah, that's fair. But anyway, I was rummaging through my sister's room looking for discs that would fit in my newly found device, and I found... Uh, no Doubt's first album, uh, Ooh, the name of it, uh, is, was escaping me, and I liked it, but when I put on Sublime, I listened to the whole thing in one sitting. There you go. I, and I was so intently listening to it, and so that's what started my journey towards being able to appreciate and enjoy music. That's actually very cool. Um... I was always listening to music. I mean, it's just my musical range has uh, changed drastically over the years. Um, I started out with the, the Queen and the ACDC, and then I got, as I got a little bit older, that was right when the right when I got about six or seven. That's when the boy band craze started, and so then I was super into the NSYNCs and the Backstreet Boys and all that good jazz. Uh, and then so that, I listen. That stuff is neither good nor jazz. No wonder <laughs> why your music is so questionable. No, it was it was. I liked it. I liked it, and it it's fun to listen to that every once in a while to bring me back to those days when I was six and I could still know all the words to Bye Bye Bye. Um, and then from How there, dare you put the chorus in my head. How dare you? What is wrong with you? I thought we were friends. Yeah, I know. Why? <laughs> because because I have nothing better to do. What? Um, and then I, uh, progress into, to the Radio Disney stage, which was not my brightest, uh, or proudest, um, Disney phase, but that was a lot of, a lot of Aaron Carter's, Baja Men, stuff like that. Wow. Um, then I got into country for a little bit, like from 2003 to seven ish is my range of country. Um, and then right around, uh, about 2006, five, six ish is when I, a friend of mine gave me his Green Day American Idiot CD and I listened to it and I loved it. And then I got his Blink 182 Enema of the State CD and I loved it. And then that kickstarted my, the whole hard rock stage that I'm currently in of, although it's gradually progressed from the punkish rock from, Green Day and Blink-182 to a little bit of harder stuff like Disturbed to even a little bit of harder stuff than that, like Bullet for My Valentine. And then now I'm in the pop punk slash screamo, if you will, stage of like a date to remember, Pierce the Veil, Falling in Reverse, Asking Alexandria, bands like that. Uh, that's an interesting progression. By the time you got into American Idiot, uh, I had fallen in love with uh, green, uh, not Green Day. Well, a uh, uh, Green Day too. Um, Dookie and Warning were my two favorites. Uh, yeah. As as well as uh, Sublime's uh, Forty Ounces to Freedom. That was for a very long time my all time favorite album. Mhm. Uh, towards the end of high school. Oh, what's that? No, I was just gonna say. Um, yeah, that was. I like the the blend of. Old Green Day. I never got into Sublime or Real Big Fish or any of that ska-ish bands. I never really got into the rest of Sky either. There were f- uh, a few years where I did listen to it on on some sort of regular basis, but I never really loved it. That was just music that I enjoyed having on in the background, but I, I couldn't tell you what tracks or or lyrics gotcha. that I enjoyed. But towards the end of high school, my friend started inundating me with good music. Mm-hmm. To which I was given um, albums by Led Zeppelin yep. and The Doors and Miles Davis and several others. and uh, Oh, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. There you go. And so I listened to those pretty much on repeat. Uh, but as I started digging around, I started getting into live music a lot more than studio music. 
And what tipped me off to that was like my dad gave me a, a, a CD by The Who. And I was the studio and they sounded like shit. They sounded like choir boys. So I hated it. But then they gave me the double album live at Leeds. And it's like, oh, this is who they're meant to be. Like, I want, this is what I want. I, so I pretty much only listened to bands on their live stuff. And to the large extent, that's still what I prefer. Like, I will only listen to The Grateful Dead if it's a live album. Um, but Led Zeppelin's great no matter what, so I don't really have a preference. Uh, but in college, I got into uh, some progressive death metal, death metal, and that was thanks to my roommate, Mark Lambert, who is the guitarist and pretty much the music writer uh, for Painted in Exile. Mm -hmm. And I like his brand of music because it's intricate. I, I, it, it gives me a reason to sit through all the screaming and the, and, and the kind of gurgling that they do. Because, <laughs> I mean, that's really all I can say about it. I know. Uh, but these days, um, I mean, I'll just pull up my iTunes right now. I'm into a, a pretty large variety of things. Uh, there's stuff like The Avalanche and Bonobo and Wax Taylor and um, one more. Uh, they do a lot. And Ratatat that I'm really into. Then there's stuff um, like Them Crooked Vultures and Queens of the Stone Age, um, Arctic Monkeys, Arcade Fire. I like some chip tunes. Uh, Anamanaguchi, for example. And then, you know, there's some like ambient hip hop like Deltron 3030 or some alternate rock like Dinosaur Jr. that I'm really into. So I, I mean, or Emancipator, Eminem, Girl Talk. Like I, I'm into like a really diverse stuff, but the common thread through all of them is that when I first listened to it, it made me want to hear the whole album in one sitting. Mm -hmm. Or, in the case of, um, that's a really good one, Iced Earth's uh, Tragedy and Triumph, you, you hear it and you just feel inspired. And it uh, that was on purpose by them. It's, ins it's inspirational music. Yep, I I totally get what you're talking about, because um, I I've really in the past like year year and a half ish I've really gotten into listening to full albums because um, yeah. a, a lot of what I have is, a lot of what I had when I was growing up it was a lot of singles just like what I heard on the radio or just songs that I knew that I liked and I never really looked too much into what else the the band has been doing but. Ever, pretty much ever since I got a car that only played CDs, would I actually download full albums. So like I, I bought full albums of like, uh, Fall Out Boy. And not bought, made full albums of Fall Out Boy and like Falling in Reverse and, um, what is it? The Blink 182 I made the full album of. And so it's been, I love listening to full albums front to back. And the way that it's supposed to be read, I uh, listen to more so than, uh, just like singles. And that's one thing a friend of mine talked about is, Full uh, uh, albums versus greatest hits because when songs are put into an album, they're put there for a specific reason. But then on the greatest hits, it's just like there's no purpose to it. It's just like here's all of our songs that we that were most popular, so we're gonna make more money. Here you go, sort of deal. Um, but I think I think you tell a lot. I think you can tell a lot about a person based off of what their iTunes music is like and what their twenty top twenty five is. Well, and I want this to be our our final piece before we get into uh, some of our hockey related topics. Yeah. Because we've gotten like twenty minutes on this and I'm happy and let's pick it up again just another time is right. I don't like those statements of you could tell a lot of person by because I think of most things, most in most things. Uh, I could be vaguer. But for like a better way of putting it, and I think you'll know what I mean when I when I make my point, I like to think of most things as a puzzle. And so the music a person likes is only one piece of that puzzle. And for everybody, it's a different sized piece. For a musician, well, the answer is obvious. 
for a person who only listens to it uh, when they're studying, uh, it's unless they're a lawyer or a med student, they're not spending their 20s with their face in the books. Uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. That, pe- that size of that puzzle piece is different for everybody. Yep. Okay. I get what you're saying. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I don't know. I guess it's just for me that it's a lot of what, uh, a lot of the music that I listen to kind of fits into my personality and fits into like the, that, yeah, kind of the clothes that I wear and things like that. Like it's a decent part. I think it's a bit, it's a pretty good reflection of who I am. It's based off of what is all on my iTunes. Okay, that all makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. And, and when I listen to Alex, Alex asking Alexandria, I don't really hear the singer anymore. I hear you. <laughs> you right? hear me trying to be the singer and going with this, depending on what album you're listening to, either the deep growls or his more 80s-ish sounding singing vocals. Yeah, that's what I'm going for. Well, on that cliffhanger, my man, my friend, my podcast partner. Yes, sir. Let's talk about some fantasy. (laughs) Wait. All right. Is this real life or is this fantasy? Well, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. And, sir, what is that sturdy, straight, bright line that is the divide between fantasy and reality anyway? Hmm. 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 Well, let's talk about the ICHL. I hear there's something interesting going on. Sir, take it away. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, me and Matt met through the ICHL uh, because I came in as the GM, I said, yeah, the GM of the Montreal Olympics this past season. And through there, we just kind of bonded and started talking puck, and it kind of escalated into this podcast. Um, so what's interesting is, is that we have a... Uh, an anomaly. There was a team last year, part of the ICHL West, that was called the Philadelphia Aces. And obviously, Philadelphia is not in the West. So, they, we are trying to figure out, uh, what the new expansion team should be for the West. And then we'll, that means there'd be 33 teams instead of 32. Well, the Quebec Armada, because they finished the worst in the pl- after the playoffs, are no longer going to be in the ISHL East. Philadelphia will move over, and then this new team will be the new team out in the West. So and- basically, basically, this is what the NHL did with Winnipeg when it went from oh, the East, because obviously it's in the same time zone I'm in, right. to the West, because obviously it's in the same time zone you're in. Right, exactly. And, and now uh, we also have a bit of relegation. But really, it's just an excuse to, to go through the process of rebranding once again because it's not because some of the ones um, it was a majority consensus or there was a largest majority, which I know is not a logical statement, but y'all know what I mean. Right. Uh, the Quebec Armada was voted on several years ago and. Oof. It is not a very inspiring design, not a nope. very inspiring name, and nope. it's an excuse to say, hey, I think we can do better. Exactly. And it just so happened that this team was the worst team performance-wise, um, but I definitely think that the, the, the league is going to get it right. So there's two kind of deals going on. One is that the Quebec Armada is no more in the ICHL East, and Philadelphia will be moving into the East, and a new team will be out in the West. But then um, Chris and the rest of the ISHL, uh, ISHL community uh, have decided to do an ISHL World, which is a third fantasy hockey league, only this time it's in eight, eight cities, and it'll be all across the uh, – it is all across the world. The world, and yes. hopefully does not include North America. Um, well, there, there will be there. That's where the the thing kind of comes in. And so they, uh, we are in the final, the final tally of figuring out which eight, uh, which eight countries are going to get a team. Uh, 
it's right now it's due it's Canada and Brazil. And if Brazil Canada has to win. That's the thing. I voted for Brazil because I think a team in Brazil would be awesome. But if Canada wins, Canada's team can be the Quebec Armada. So the Quebec Armada. Oh, that's Armada, an interesting wrinkle. Yeah, so the Quebec Armada can still exist, but it'll be in the ISHL world instead of the East or West. Now, um, please refresh my memory. Uh, since the NHL regular season has ended, and I do this every year, is my shift slowly gravitates towards uh, the Palisades Football League, which I'm a part of, as well as the MLB baseball season. Um, right. Every night, and this happens as well as in, in September and October, but for April and May, every night, if there's some NHL hockey and there's some MLB baseball, and on the weekends, there's my PWBL wiffle ball. Uh, nice. anyway, which is all, it is nice. Anyway, this is all to say that I, my eye off of the ISHL starts to, uh, look away. It's unintentional, gotcha. but I only have three eyes. I gotcha. Anyway, so please tell us more about what's going on. Yeah, so it's it's down to eight potential countries or sixteen potential countries fighting for eight spots. It's Canada, Brazil, and it's all head to head. So Canada's facing off against Brazil. Mm-hmm. One of those is going to win. And this Russia, is single elimination, right? It's knockout. Yeah, single elimination. Like for example, Argentina was already knocked out when it faced Brazil. No. Because the whole idea is to kind of face, to kind of group countries in the same region esque, so that way it's not like there's Isn't not spread five out European all... teams and one South American team. Yes, which might actually what might end up happening. Yeah. Wait, uh, wait. Um, one more question. Yes. Uh, before I let you finish, did we have a team in the following places? Okay. Or did we have a country in the bracket in the following places? The North Pole. Antarctica. No, no. Greenland. Uh, don't think there's one in Greenland. Okay. And then ran, just random islands in the Atlantic or the Pacific, you know, the Faulkner Islands. Uh, 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 yes and no. Okay. Um, so this is what I'll get, I'll kind of get to this is what the, the countries are. Okay. Uh, it's Canada, Brazil. Mm-hmm. Russia versus Latvia. Mm hmm. <laughs> Sweden versus Finland. Uh huh. And then, uh, in the end of Division A, it's Japan versus China. Okay. Um, what's funny is, is in the early round, it was Russia versus Ukraine. I voted for Ukraine, but Russia <laughs> advanced. Oh, man. Oh, uh, now. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. Um, and then over uh, in Division B, it's the UK and France. Mm hmm. Australia. Oh, he did UK. He did the whole kingdom? He did, uh, oh, might be, well, it might be Great Britain. And. Okay, cause that, that's, that's different. Well, cause Ireland is, uh, is a separate yeah, country. Then he did, he did Great Britain. Did Great Britain. Might be, might be to my UK, uh, Great Britain and English fans. I, yeah, that's Oh, no, you just have to apologize to the Irish. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> okay, whatever. Um, uh, and then it's Australia and New Zealand fought off, fought each other in the first round, and mm-hmm. Australia won. And Australia is facing uh, South Africa. Mm-hmm. Germany is facing off against the Swiss. <laughs> and then Greece is fighting off uh, is facing off against Egypt. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yes. Now, where are we? Which which of these seem determined? What do you mean? Who looks like is going to be the uh, the winner in these brackets? Oh, all of the results are hidden until the until they're closed. Gotcha. So you can't see who's winning. But I voted for Brazil, Russia, Sweden, and China, and then I voted for the UK, uh, South Africa, Germany, and Egypt. All right. Well, I'm going to hold off on my voting until uh, until we're done. But this is who I'm going to vote for. Yeah. Brazil, Latvia, Brazil because we we don't need another North American team. I second that. All right. So Brazil by default. Although I would vote for Brazil regardless. 
Latvia because it's the lesser of the, it's the lesser. Right. Again, we don't need, I'm not against Russia so much as I am pro, um, unusual country. And so you'll okay. see, uh, Sweden over Finland because I, I want to live in Stockholm for a while. Yep. In my life. Uh, Japan because I prefer Japanese food. Okay. Um, I, I believe that's the Great Britain flag. Yeah. But France. Um, again, because it's the lesser. Uh, you said that's Australia and who? New Zealand? South Africa. South Africa. I mean, I don't, I, I don't have a preference. So South Africa, because it's, because it's in Africa. Uh-huh. Switzerland, because again, it's the lesser. Yep. Uh, and then Egypt, because, um, it's random as hell. <laughs> exactly. And I think we could have a lot of, I think the SHL community could have a lot of fun branding an Egyptian team. Like, think about it. The, the Cairo Scepters or something like that. You could, yeah. Or yeah. The Cairo Pharaohs or something like that. And even if the name isn't in, unstereotypical, the design can still be really, really cool. Exactly. I'm, I am disappointed though that, uh, more random countries didn't quite uh, have a chance. Yeah. Ireland, Turkey. Um, I did not realize four countries basically have the same exact flag. Just well, they're, they're all the 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 uh, the Baltic uh, countries. And Scandinavian, yeah. Yeah, Scandinavian. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, I didn't like. All right, so I like these groupings. I like the idea behind them. I'm just disappointed to see that like Turkey and Ireland didn't make it through. Yeah, I mean the thing was is that I, Chris wanted to do it via uh, regions, mm-hmm. and that which is nice. Sense. Yeah, and and that's so that's like there's one the, there's the Middle Eastern, there's the uh, Western, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Scandinavians, Far East. You get the four corners of the earth. Right. So exactly. Safe. Yeah. So that's what's going in uh, the SHA world, and then for. Uh, honestly, we talked about that there is going to be a team in, uh, Hawaii. That was the team that, that's the city that was voted by the, uh, by the, the voters. And we are down to the top eight team names. I Um, love that Hawaii got a name. Now, I would have preferred, like, Cheyenne, Wyoming, or Whitefish. What is it? Whitefish or White Horse? Montana? I think it was White Horse. But that's just my own personal preference because I think, oh, it's winter, it's kind of isolated and random, whatever. Right. I love that Hawaii got a, got a team. Now these nicknames, Tiki's or Tiki's, Totems, Akua, and Kea, yeah. uh, they're very uninspiring to these ears, but still, dude, we got Hawaii in on the mix. This is so cool. Um, yeah, I think that What's cool about it is that I was actually poison, uh, pulling for Boise because I think Boise would be a great city uh, for the ISHL because it's kind of up in that upper north northwestern region that no not many sporting teams hit, and I think that you could have a lot of fun with like Idaho, Montana, and that kind of that kind of range. Um, but the I think the names, I mean, at least in my point, I think Hanu is far far and away, or Honu, or however you pronounce it is going to run away with it because it means green sea turtles and it's the native animal of Hawaii. And I just think that the name Hanu, like the the Honolulu Hanu or the Oahu Hanu, it just kind of has a, a Hawaiian ring to it that I think would be very cool. And the designs yeah, could get... That's very euphonious, yeah. Yeah, and the, the designs could get really fun. Um, however, don't you be knocking the Akua because you don't even know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So I read it before I, I saw the definition. So the yes. options are tikis versus volcanoes, destroys versus akua, akua being one second, the gods who created everything and keep everything working, according to MythHome.org, and on this ICHL page. Um, the other options are destroyers versus akua, hanu, 
versus Emeralds and Koa Warriors is the Eels. And now, sir, yes. now that I've seen the Koa Warriors, is there another choice? To me, there's no other choice. It has to be the Koa Warriors. See, I think it's weird because I don't, I don't know, because at least for me, like the, the University of Hawaii, their name is the Warriors. So just by adding the Koa in front of it, I think uh, it, it, it's a little bit of a cop out. Um, okay. Yeah. And so, but you, I think it, I think it is a good name. Okay. Well, fuck. You know, I just realized part of our discussion last year when talking about who we should name the, the Philadelphia team. Yeah. As we were talking about the redundancy of some of the tropes in our, uh, in our names, but we didn't want to do another animal because we had, right. we have so many animals. So I'm looking at the Ice Age East and the animals include the blue crabs, the night hawks, the barracudas, and the steel cats. Uh-huh. And that's already four. That's four out of sixteen. Um, and now let's people who fight include the, the colonials, the guardians, the sentinels, the mariners. Oh, we also have the dragons. So that's five, 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 uh, five animals. Yep. It's so a colonials, guardians. Sentinels, Mariners, Archers, um, and Armada, and Hitmen. That's seven fighters. That's 12 out of 14. That are either or an animal or a fighter of some kind. So, no, we have five, five and seven. Yeah, that's 12 out of 16 teams. So you know what? Maybe it comes down to the Akua. They're, they're the one that's not chosen. They're the unrepresented trope. Exactly. And I personally like it because I was the one that submitted the name. <laughs> oh, oh, well, that, now, all right, I'm going to vote right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, because I was like, oh, I got to get on this. And I found the Akua. And I was like, oh, th- just think about it. The Hawaii Akua or the Oahu Akua or even the Honolulu Akua. Like, it, ooh, the Honolulu Akua. That has a nice. Yeah, that's that. Oh, does that flow or does that flow? The Honolulu Akua. That is how it should be. And the nice thing about that is, is that it's because it's it's a Hawaiian name, so you can still have the like the tiki's or the totems or the same kind of um logo, Visual. yeah, logo, logo around it. You. Yeah, the logo around the name, but it's it gives a lot more for free design. Yeah, Which a lot like. more freedom for design. Yeah. And so that's, I don't know, that's why, I, that's why I'm definitely voting the Akua through. Um, but yeah, I think, I think if in a perfect world, the, the finals is the Akua and the Hanu for the final. I just want the Akua to win. Yep, I'm an Akua, baby. There we go. An Akua. Cause yeah, you could pretty much do anything. You could have a Koa warrior as an Akua, and nobody would know the difference. Wow. Dude, you gotta tell the whole ISHL world about this. About the, uh... About about everything you've just said on this podcast, about the Akua and and how dynamic and diverse it can be. Yeah. I'll throw that, uh, I might throw that up there on the next... Akua! Hey, how how do you think the uh, the chants would sound? Akua! 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 I, so, I thought it would be a little longer, but like, Akua! Akua! Oh, that sounds kind of dumb. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of like, it's three, that's the thing, it's three syllables. So you can't do Let's Go Blues or Go Heads Go. Akua! And you can't go Let's Go, Let's Go, Akua. Well, they, well, well you can do that. They do Let's Go Avalanche. Yeah, that's, yeah. Let's Go Avalanche! avalanche. Let's go, Akua. Yeah. Or what's what's the Hawaiian way to say let's go? I don't know. Don't they speak English? Yeah, but they also speak Hawaiian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> here we go, Akua. Here, here we go. go. Yep, I like that. Oh, Molokai? 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 Alakai. No. Uh, this is the sirens. Fly, 
Oh, Jesus. It's Ola Aya Ka Kaua. Kaua? Ola Aya Kaua. Kaua. No, okay, never mind. I'm going to stop trying to pronounce that. But yeah, so that is what, <laughs> that's been, that has been your ISHL update for our fearless listeners. That was awesome. Thank you. All right, bud. Um, what's our next topic again? Well, so I, I guess so. We I, I don't know if we talked about it on the show on the, the show or not, but the reason why uh, we are recording today, Wednesday, May seventh, instead of our normal Tuesday, which happened to be May sixth, is because I just got finished with my finals week here at school. Which means summer is, summer is here and it's fantastic. Um, but one of the cool things was, is one of the classes I took this semester was investigative reporting. And in this reporting class, I had a major project that I had to do. Mm-hmm. And my final project was called Knocked Out. And what it was, it was looking at concussions in both the NHL and the NFL. And if there's any correlation between the two, if one league is significantly more than the other, what it means for the health of the players, what's been going on outside of the field, all this different stuff. And I kind of wrapped it up into one one big place to where if somebody wanted to just find out information about the NFL or the NHL concussions, they could go read this paper and it would be good. And it'd be it's a if it it came out at a two hundred two thousand six hundred and twenty two word story. Wow. Yes. That is an essay. Yeah, it's it was fun though because it's it's written like a news story rather than just a paper, which I liked a lot. All right. Now tell us more, please. Yes. So the biggest thing I did is I wanted to look at specifically the 2013 NFL season and 2013 NHL season because It's where I was able to find the most relevant information. It was the most recent information, so it wasn't, like, dated or anything like that. And it was something that I'd be able to actually monitor, especially in the NHL, as the season progressed. And so um, what I did is, and what kind of jump-started this fascination for the concussions and the way I got it was is uh, it was mostly when I – immediately when I went into this investigative reporting class, the – the story I immediately thought of was the story the New York Times put out on Derek Bogard after he died uh, from his drug overdose, and it was just it was a three part um, it was a three part story with videos uh, on all three parts. It's like if you, I mean you could legitimately spend an hour and a half reading the story and watching the videos and just all this different stuff. It's a great multimedia investigative reporting piece, uh, probably one of my favorite stories I've read all time. And that really kind of kickstarted when it was written. It kickstarted uh, my just kind of fascination with concussions in the NHL. And then uh, in this class, it, it was in the forefront of my mind. So when I found out that we had to do this this project, it immediately came to my mind. It's what I, something that I wanted to do, and I thought I could do it well. Um, so I, I started off with looking at basically kind of six case studies. Um, I didn't go into too much detail. Just because it wasn't going to be the, this major part of the story, it was going to be a lot more background and setting setting up the story. Um, but I looked at uh, Wade uh, Bilak, or however you say his name, Rick Ripon, or however you say his name, and Derek Bogard for the for the NHL, and then the NFL. It was um, what was this guy? It, it was David Dorson, Junior Seau. And Javon Belcher. And for those of you who don't know, uh, David Burst, uh, Thorson committed suicide in 2011. He was a four-time Pro Bowler. Uh, Junior Seau also committed suicide in 2012. Um, and he was a 12-time Pro Bowler. And then at the end of 2012 was Javon Belcher, which was the Kansas City, uh, lineman who shot his girlfriend and then committed suicide at the Kansas City, um, at the Kansas City, tra- uh, Chiefs practice facility. And so that was harrowing. Do you remember that when that came out? That just, oh yeah. That, that they just stop and drop your jaw. It's like, how? Like suicide with Ju- with Junior Seau is, is 
That was bad. I remember that one bad. That but like, bad. but this, this suicide one. has an suicide has an air of of now you're no longer in pain, which is like uh, misleading in a lot of ways right. and for a lot of reasons. But like, it has an air of well, uh, but murder suicide. And then the story they came out afterwards. I mean, that was... Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, that was harrowing. Yeah, and that's the other thing that I found is five out of the six players committed suicide. Derek Bogart was the only one who didn't, and he OD'd on painkillers. And that could have been an accidental on purpose kind of situation where... Right, exactly. And so that's where it's just like... So it was just all these very weird... Like, they all happened in a short pan. They all had short span of time they all had a lot of these very similar characteristics and five out of the six ended up having chronic trauma encephalopathy or cte as it's wow, well done. done thank you uh, i've had to say it like 12 different times in the past day and a half so i really figured out how to say it um <laughs> but they all had it they all had cte and well five out of the six did javon belcher was the only one who hasn't officially been reported saying that he had it but his body has been exhumed to to figure out if he did or not, and the uh, the reports haven't come out yet. But so it just kind of goes to look at what what has been the CTE, and CTE is a degenerative brain disease that uh, is a similar esque of uh, disease to Alzheimer's in the sense that there there's memory loss, there's mood swings, there's depression, there's all these different things that can show signs of it when they're alive, but it can't be formally diagnosed until they have passed. And since the the Center for Study of CTE in uh, Boston University has, has really started looking at it, there have been 33 players in the NFL that have been diagnosed with CTE. And then uh, in hockey, there's only been six. But four of those have been Bogard, Balick, Ripon, and Bob Probert. So four big names that have come out in the last, in the last few years. And then BU School of Medicine also did the study of 36 male athletes to see how many had the signs of CTE. And of the athletes that primarily played football and hockey, 33 of the 36 showed signs of CTE. So it's not necessarily, exactly, it's not necessarily these, the, it's not necessarily the, uh, the, the enforcers that are having it, it could be just anybody in the league could potentially be starting to see CDC TE problems. All right. Did you, were you able to get to the cause or the possible or hopefully probable causes of yeah. CTE? The big, the, the, what causes CTE is repetitive hits to the head. That is what, that's what causes CTE and the most significant of those injuries are concussions because those are the hits to the head that do that leave bruising of the brain and takes a while for the brain to kind of get back into its bearings and things like that. And so if you repeatedly have concussions, which are major, major blows to the head and brain that can significantly improve the likelihood of getting CTE, which is why I really wanted to look at the 2013 season in the NFL and the NHL and figure out. So, how bad are concussions? How more likely are they? Things like that. Um, so the first league I looked at was the NFL, uh, because they have a much, they have a much better approach to injury reports and things like that. And I found out that in the 2013 season, across all 32 teams, there were 235 concussions. And the teams with the most, yeah, it's, it's a pretty big number. It's, um, if you think about it, it's what, 32 times 16. Let me let me quickly pull out the calculator to figure out how many games that is, and then we'll we'll do a little quick maths that I probably should have done in my paper. That's, but I didn't think about that's it. That's uh, seven. Uh, that's over seven people per team. Yeah, um, or about a concussion every two games. And oh, and that's across the whole league. That's not sixteen games. That's Every other, every other game. So about half the, the, the league games had a featured concussion. A, featured a concussion, yes. Cause there's Holy about 500, there's, a, there's 512 games per, 
uh, per NFL season across the board. 50% of league games had a concussion in it. Yes. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So that's, uh, the, the teams that had the most concussions, uh, were the Cincinnati Bengals and the Jacksonville Jaguars, uh, with about, I believe it was 12 or 13. Um, and then the Jaguars had led the league with two players that had multiple concussions over the course of the season, meaning that they had two players that suffered two or more concussions, uh, in the single season. And then over on the NHL, obviously we know that, um, we obviously know that teams like to use the upper body and lower body injury report rather than actual concussion. But um, what what I found out is that there were 235 reported upper body injuries uh, within across the league for the entire season. So again, that can mean it could mean that a that player has a concussion. Or B, it can mean that they broke a hand or separated a shoulder or just having back spasms or something like that. And the team just wants to report it as a day-to-day upper body injury rather than actually say what's wrong. Um, so then if you're, if you're counting at home, that means it's about one upper body injury per 10.5, 10 and a half games, uh, for the NHL. So that means that one out of every 10 games featured some sort of upper body injury within the league. But I found that there were 66 confirmed concussions over the course of the season, uh, meaning that of those 235 reported upper body injuries, 66 of them were actual concussions. And that number comes out to one concussion every 37 games. So that's, I mean, that's still pretty bad because that's once every three, four days. And yeah, I was just trying to do that math in my head. If you think about it, because you think there's a, anywhere between 10 to anywhere between four to 10 games per day. Well, no, that's, so that's about once every, uh, yeah, I'd say anywhere between three to six days. So, so twice a week, about twice a week featured a concussion. Exactly. Featured, uh, uh, featured a concussion, uh, in the NHL. And, uh. Wow, yeah, compared the, to the NFL. Yeah, I mean, teams that had the most concussions were, uh, the St. Louis Blues, Carolina Hurricanes, and, uh, Buffalo Sabres. Those were the teams that had the top three in concussions, uh, or upper body injuries, let me say. And that was about, um, about 15 to 16 players over the course of the season. Uh, 14, 15 to 16 upper body injuries. Cause, uh, like instance for the Blues, a couple of players had multiple upper body injuries. Um, but what I did find out is that in the NHL's case, the number of 66 actually, uh, had been dropping. The, the concussions had been going up and then they, they started dropping this year. Um, in 2009, 2010, there were 44 concussions with 24 suspected concussions, meaning that 44 confirmed and 24 that were not confirmed but believed to be concussions. Um, in 2010, 2011, there were 65 official with 42 reported, uh, suspected. And then in 2011, 2012, there was 84 concussions and 36 more suspected concussions, which brings out that number to about one, uh, 120, 120 unofficial concussions for, for the NHL. Were you able to uh, get the playoff numbers? No, because the the database that I used only kept uh, regular season. Gotcha. Which is uh which is unfortunate. It um, is unfortunate, be- but now that we've gone through the numbers, mm-hmm. why don't you uh, give us a couple of quick hits on some of the prime takeaways for you from all this data? Um, the biggest thing I, I found out with, with all the data is that it, it really does seem like that the NFL has more concussions. I mean, obviously the numbers show that the NFL has a drastic amount of concussions compared to the NHL. Part of that, it deals with the large roster because the NFL player employs 52 players per team, whereas the NHL only does 20. So 
naturally less heads means less concussions. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that, uh, it's the, uh, a big reason why I was also looking at this was, uh, you always hear of NFL players who get their bell rung, have concussion like symptoms or leave with a head injury. And then the next week they, they happens on a Monday night and then they have a Sunday game and oh yeah, they're ready to go. It's like, well, how much time are they actually, are they delegating? As whereas the NHL, you see they have a concussion, they go through the concussion protocol, it's very open. And I think what that is, is that the NHL has set the standard that they're not going to tolerate any head injuries at all. And that's what the institution, institution of Rule 48, and while it hasn't always been fantastic, the Department of Player Safety has, uh, they have gone a little bit harsher for suspensions that deal with head injuries and players that end up getting concussed on these hits. And in the NFL, you don't see that. It wasn't only until last year or even two years ago. Well, last year they just instituted the rule where you can't use the crown of the helmet as uh, otherwise you're going to get flagged for a 15-yard penalty. And they really started handing out fines for headshots and one-game suspensions for uh, unnecessary roughness, roughness where the player's head was a principal point of contact. And so you, I think you're really starting to see the NFL uh, start to take seriously the this problem because of the recent lawsuit that they had where they had to dish out $765 million. And the NHL was able to get ahead of it, but they're still facing their own lawsuit, and they're they're dealing with that right now. And so it looks like the, NA, the NHL is about a year to two years ahead of where the NFL is, and it's starting to show that in the NHL the numbers are starting to go down, whereas in the NFL – they're rising because players are trying to change their game and they're really starting to, they're really, the concussion protocol got a lot tougher with this new CBA. And so they're, they're definitely seeing an increase because they're taking more precautions with it and the numbers going to slowly die down like you're seeing in the NHL. All right. Well, let me throw a monkey wrench into that theory. Okay. Just like boxing and, uh, and fighting, yep. football benefits from the very, very easy to uh, armchair diagnose a concussion. Football deals with a lot of sudden impacts and also either parallel or right angle impacts. The NFL has the benefit of clearly viewable hits from head to toe. It moves slow enough. The cameras are everywhere. And there's enough space between the players and the field of view that it's not obscured by anything. And you can see it from nearly every angle. Hockey has none of that, save for a fight and an open ice hit. Whenever something happens near the wall, any of the walls, you get one, maybe two angles. You're cut off from the view of the fan looking in, you will only get the view from the ice or the jumbotron looking towards the boards. The play may be obscured in some way when, um, when other players join the area. And the impacts aren't as sudden. They're predictable. And they're not as clean as in football. Football impacts need to be clean, otherwise the offensive player or the defensive player, if it's a fumble or, or an interception, is going to have free reign over the gridiron. Hockey isn't like that. Hockey isn't played like that. We can have partial impacts that have a wide-ranging effect on a play, whereas in football, man you got to stop that guy, plain and simple. Maybe you can slow him down for your teammate if you need a line of scrimmage. But otherwise, it's a series of one-on-one -on -one battles. You either succeed or you don't. Hockey isn't like that. Hockey doesn't have that flat-out success or failure moment. Hockey is played a lot more like uh, soccer where you can have a lot of success uh, leading up to your attempt to, uh, a shot on goal, and then it could all go kaplooey. Mm -hmm. And then you can retrieve the puck and start all over, all over again. What I'm curious about 
is how easy it is for hockey players to obscure their injury, to lie about their injury. Because I don't think football players have that ability. I don't think you can see Champ Bailey tackle a guy cleanly, you know, shoulder through the chest, and then not see the receiver have his head hit the turf. There's no angle you won't see that. You'll see it live even. In hockey, um, Sidney Crosby could be digging the puck out of the corner and Derek Dorsett can line him up shoulder through the chest and you may not see that the back of Crosby's head hits the glass. It may not be an angle for that. He also may not stay down. He may join the rush. And you know as well as I do, there's a very uh, important difference between a, a pain or an impact that stops you in your tracks at, and one that hurts, but you're able to keep going. And maybe once you slow down and take a minute, then you're able to assess the damage. Now, one last thing before we get going. Mm-hmm. Puck Daddy, Greg Wyshynski, printed... Uh, an article about an hour ago. This is why NHL concussion protocols fail. And it talks about James Wisniewski lying to his trainers about his injury because he didn't want to go to the back room and sit for 20 minutes. I don't know that a football player could lie and, and, and the doctors believe him. I think that the, the, the line of view and the obviousness of the impact is too great. Whereas hockey, it's much more easily uh, obscured. Um, I think that you brought up a very good point in the, how the field of vision affects not necessarily the fans, but the, the angles at which you can see if he actually has a concussion or not. Um, in the NHL, I think, I still think it's fairly, not easy, but like you can tell when a player has had, gets hit in the head. Um, uh, you can see like the head snap back or just the way, just the way it is. I mean, my, my biggest example is, is that when, uh, when David Backus, uh, got hit by Brent Seabrook, you could see he got hit in the head. I mean, and at first it didn't look like that he necessarily was hit in the head. Um, but you could easily tell by when he staggered up that he was just out of it. And I think mm-hmm. that's the biggest thing is you can tell when he, when they're out of it. And with, and James Winooski's, Winooski's case, um, he hit it very well because it, it was, you couldn't really tell that he got hit and things like that. And he didn't seem necessarily out of it, but it was, I don't think he act, did he, in the article, did it say that he did suffer a concussion? Or just that the concussion protocol failed. He said, I know he said his head wasn't in the game, but did it say that he was officially, that he was actually concussed? I said my back hurt so I didn't have to do the 20 minute concussion protocol and go through the whole concussion process. I didn't feel like going in and talking to the doctors for 20 minutes. Uh, that was just a quote. Right. So I didn't feel great in game six. No, it doesn't, it doesn't say, it does not confirm whether or not there was a concussion. Although I'd say the tone of this argument and the tone of that quote implies that there was one. Right. And I think that's, I think that's another thing that you, we see in that when, when, uh, in football, you can tell kind of how the, how bad the, the head injury is based off of the, the uh impact and things like that. Whereas I think at the NHL it is a lot more of the mercy in the players and if they if they actually do and also but I also think it's a lot of the, the relationship between the trainers and the players because the trainers are gonna know if there's something up. And if there's something up then it's gonna be like, okay, you need to go in the back regardless of what the player actually Well says. you would think that, but it seems as though Wisniewski was able to uh get by and Look, I, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole uh, at this particular time of whether or not the trainers should or should not be able to tell. Right. I, I don't feel like I know enough about that subject, despite having a long history of concussions myself. I don't know that a trainer – I don't know if a trainer should be able to tell. 
outside of the obvious of what you're talking about with David Backus. Yeah, when a guy stands up and, and he's uh, standing in circles like like a cartoon character, there's your sign. But mm. in, in Wisniewski's case, I'm watching the GIF, and it looks like his face goes into the boards. But you know what? He gets pushed in in the upper back sh- uh, shoulder region, and it's perfectly reasonable for me to accept that, nah, man, I just got drilled in the spine. It's not a concussion. As, as well as I could buy an argument from a trainer saying, well, there are kind of different kinds of concussions because when you get pushed in, or different ways to receive a concussion, rather, you know, it doesn't have to be a direct bullet in the head. When you get pushed in the upper part of your back and you're off balance, your head naturally snaps back a little bit. And then the, imp- the impact of your face or your helmet meeting the boards helps create the extra impact that bruises the brain. Whereas if he had just gone in, well, for like a better way of putting it, naturally, he would have been able to brace his body. I, I don't know. I like I'm just I'm just spitballing aloud out here. Yeah. But if I were to talk to James in the back room after this and he's telling me it's just my back, it's just my back, and my head is fine. I, I don't know I don't know how I don't believe it. Right. I don't know. Uh that that's that's it. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, that's the problem with these concussions with concussions is that there's a is a lot of gray area and that there's not one yeah. con- there's not well, okay, that was a bad joke. Um uh, no, that was unintentional. But take credit for that. That was good. Right. Um is that it, no one no two concussions are alike, which is why they're so hard to diagnose and why it's such a problem because Concussions might not be that big of a deal for one person, but one concussion could be a huge deal for another. Um, yeah, exactly. And, yeah, it's like, I mean... Um, you, can, you can think about... Sorry about that. No, you just think about our, our muscles and our skeletons. It could take... I'm just going to use round numbers here. It could take 100 pounds of force to tear my bicep or to break my hand. But for you, it may only be 50 pounds of force. And that's just the way we're built, man. That's it. That, that's the only difference. Our, our, our structural integrity and resiliency. Well, the same, you know, the brain is a, is a muscle and it's surrounded by bone and you could have the same amount of variance in integrity and resilience. It doesn't matter that they're a professional athlete. You know, we're like not even twins. Twins are only, um, identical or identical twins are only identical on the surface. Otherwise, they have completely separate DNA and unique features uh, amongst themselves. So you're right. No two are the same, and they can't be the same. And that just makes it all the more difficult. And the last piece of the difficulty pie is that the brain can lie. Yep. Ah, So difficult. So difficult. Yeah, it is. Which is why that it's... I, I talk about it at the end. It's like you're not going to, you're not going to ever completely eliminate concussions. And part of part of just the nature of the sport is that it is violent and that you will have them. But the the leagues are putting rules in place to make it safer. And it seems like, especially in the NHL's case, it's starting to work. But they still have a lot of stuff to do, and there's still a lot of things that they can do in order to improve the concussions and lower the numbers even more. Okay, last part before we move on to the next topic. Yes. What can the NHL do or what can players do to help reduce the likeliness of a concussion? Um there there have been a few rule changes like uh like the the sen uh, not the center ice the icing rule and um just like things like that where the, it kind of reduces the risk of these big, these big injuries that can't happen. Um, but I think a lot of it is on the player. And first and foremost, it's a, there needs to be a culture of respecting the player in the sense that if you, kind of like what we talked about sparing, is that if you concuss a player like that, that's bad on you. Not necessarily on them too. I mean, it's bad for both players and it's like, if you see somebody but that, re- but it's worse on the aggressor because it was a conscious decision to not right. be, be in a better position, or in some cases, and this does happen, the receiver 
put themselves in a terrible position where there is an impending impact at the blue right. line, and, and that's, you have to keep your head up, buddy. Exactly. That's why it's kind of difficult to say, oh, it's all the aggressor's fault, because no, because like if a player keeps his head down, and a, if he's skating with his head down and a guy lines him up and just obliterates him and he flies back and hits his head back on the ice, it's on the players who was skating with his head down, putting it in a, in a vulnerable position that yeah, that it's you remember Brian back. Campbell on Jeff Carter. Yeah, exactly. It's just like you, you. That's not that's not the the hitter's fault. Um, one thing that I I have thought about um is having uh mandatory mouth guards because mouth guards help reduce yeah. uh help reduce the the kind of concussions because like the sudden jar it when you bite down on your teeth that's just another added force of pressure to your head. And so just that, cu- that cushion can kind of, uh, can kind of help, um, softening the pads or make, or not softening the pads, softening the pads in the helmets or making the helmets a little bit bigger or more plastic, more absorbent so that they absorb more of the force. Don't you think that's what the NFL tried to do with their helmets? What do you mean? Like the. Made them huge. Well, I mean, okay, but did you look at Wes Welker's, like, Darth helmet helmet? No. Uh, look up. Let me see if I can find a photo Wes of it. Wes Welker, Darth Helmet. No, we'll just well, Wes Welker concussion helmet. I I have a uh, an amateur concussion helmet. It looks like Petter Check of uh, Chelsea. Looks like his helmet a little bit that I wear in rec sports. In uh, Chelsea, what do you mean? Uh, the English Premier League club. Oh, dude, where's the goaltender? The goaltender goal the goal the goal for the English Premier League team, Chelsea, wears a concussion helmet. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, and, and I have a uh, a model after that. Um, oh, so, okay. So on this photo, it, I presume the the one on the left is the concussion helmet. Yes. And it's comically large. Exactly, it's comically large. So, like, I mean. If every player has that sort of helmet, then that's fine. Like, that's no problem. It's just part of the extra gear that you have. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, it looks a little ridiculous, but I mean, it's not that big of a deal if everybody wears the exact same sized helmet. Um, and then, yeah, so I think softer, softer, more absorbent pads slash plastic in the helmet. And then, and I know a big, uh, a big proponent has been softening the elbow pads and, and, uh, shoulder pads. Um, I personally don't necessarily like the rule because then it makes the hitter more vulnerable than the hitty, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. I think you're gonna, get, you're gonna get, if you soften up the pads, I think you're gonna get a lot more bruised shoulders, separated shoulders, things like that. And when people go down to block a shot and they take a shot up high, it's gonna hurt more then than they would with these new pads. And so that's why I think it's, uh, I don't necessarily like that rule of softening up the pads. All right. So, Quickly, my point of view is we need to find better material to make pads out of. That's it. We need yep. to find a better material. It, I, the, the best material I can think of right now is embedded foam into clothing. Uh, if you watch any post game stuff, you see a lot of athletes wearing that now where, um, all along the joints, all the joints and along the thighs and the ribs, they have embedded cushioning in their pads and what that allows them to do is that allows them to wear thinner lighter plastic pads as their normal yeah. pads so they have two layers of pads one for cushioning the, the side closest to the body and then an outer shell it's much lighter much thinner and that's a really important juncture because but it a lot of the force is being delivered through wearing hard material Mm-hmm. And that's just simple physics. Hardness material, the mass of the material, plus the velocity. There you go. Mm-hmm. If we are able to find a better material that's protective, but on the softer side, and that may not exist, but if we are able to develop it, that'll make everything a lot safer. Because if you don't have to wear hard plastic, oh my gosh, that still may hurt. And some guys may still do it, um, or wear it rather, when it comes to blocking shots. But 
I would rather see a guy who mainly wears um, something closer to foam padding and then his pants, you know, to protect the hips or yeah. maybe the capsule around the knee is made out of plastic. Um, you know, it's a, it's a combination effort. Yeah, I agree. 